It started, I thought I had been crazy <laughs> over time to spend so much time in sports, but I don't regret anything. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be invited here to give uh, a little review of my life and what's happening in a little uh, place, Wonsbro, I was born. At that time, a small uh, village, and in the 50s, about 1,500 to 2,000 residents. And uh, the, the most famous guys from there, uh, uh, a rock star, Björn Schiffs, who lived next door to me. And uh, the other is uh, uh, Gunde Swan, <laughs> cross-country legend. So there you see Björn Schiffs, and you see that they have some creative ideas in this area. And here is my uh, graduation student examen in Ludvika, Högre Almena Lerwek, in 1956. Uh, this is uh, the hockey team that were playing uh, the Kronprinsens Cup and got uh, to the final. Small Ludvika played the final against Södertälje and lost. So, I went on to Uppsala for medical studies and uh, continuous education and spent two years in Uppsala. And then by chance, I moved to Gothenburg to play in the uh, Frölunda team, uh, ice hockey at the same time. A stupid decision maybe, but I had some fractured experience. Uh, it ended up with my uh, uh, MD or Medlis, 66, and uh, then I spent five years in general surgery at the Kungel Hospital, small acute hospital at the time, where you were on service uh, uh, day and night, every other or every third day. So uh, there was not much uh, uh, time for other stuff uh, like uh, girls. Special general surgery, a specialist in general surgery in 71. And then, uh, of course, uh, I had some uh, children, pediatric surgery. And then in 1970, I started orthopedic surgery and became a specialist in 72. This is the Uppsala team from Westmanland Dala Nation, who won the cup in Uppsala for football before I left. And here is the Frölunda team. Uh, where I uh, joined in 1960 and uh, left in 64. And here was the sport fo sports photo of the year. If you look carefully, see it's me, number 20. And uh, I, I didn't score that time, but... <laughs> uh, this is also a little test that I played against IFK Norrköping with the Örgryte, the oldest football club in Sweden, uh, in 1960 to 64. This is my chief, Bertil Stener, professor of orthopedics. He talked me into orthopedics, uh, mainly because I played in Oes. <laughs> <laughs> because he was the team physician of Oes. Okay, going further, clinical academic achievements. I never thought I would reach that coming from the forest and uh, country on lakes in the northwest of Dalarna. I had the, my thesis defended in 1974. It was a fracture of the neck of the talus. It's, it's not here, it's here in the, in the ankle. The talus is the uh, sprung benet in Swedish. Uh, Bertil was an enthusiast. We played tennis for 25 years every Sunday morning at 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock. And then he told me, Lars, can you come at 7? Why? Yeah, there is a free time. We can warm up before we do the two-hour doubles. <laughs> so, there was no time for late parties on Saturdays. <laughs> Clinical academic achievements continue with an assistant professorship uh, and a deputy chief at the orthopedic department after my uh, disputation. And I was a docent or associate professor in 1980. And I got professorship in 2000. I also, as it mentioned, had a Dr. Honoris Causa at the University of Helsinki, which is hard for a Swede. 
uh, but uh, it was very fantastic and at the univers University of Murcia in Spain. Uh, this is the party uh, at my disputation, and they were joking about my sports interest, as you can see. And uh, I took care of the Swedish national team uh, in ice hockey uh, over a period of five years. And I also got involved in uh, Jofa in Malung as a medical consultant in 1969. Very young and unexperienced, but uh, had an interest in sport. We started to do an evaluation of any protective equipment in the market. And we had testing technique to see what was the uh, forces that they could uh, 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 take up without uh, damaging uh, the body. And that was very negative. Even Jofa's own uh, equipment was a uh, disaster. So we started by protecting the head, of course, and then the face. And this changed the, 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 the situation of injuries, both in the head, but also in the face, with eye injuries, tooth injuries, wounds and cheek injuries. So for me, this area has been one of the most exciting and rewarding uh, uh, works I have done. Backed on a patent that I had, we developed new uh, protective equipment with the joint discharge principle, which meant that you unloaded the most vulnerable area by taking the forces on more uh, uh, stronger areas and not so uh, like muscles around the, the shoulder uh, or uh, muscles on tendons around the knee. So we also did the first plastic a skate for ice hockey. Uh, it was in, in collaboration with Koflash in Austria, which Volvo bought at the time. And it was really a great uh, skate because you never get this uh, uh, weakness and tiredness in their ankle. But um, after a while, uh, other uh, companies took over, so uh, they changed the model. This is a Swedish ice uh, football team after a final uh, win over Poland in 1990, and uh, they were qualified for the World Cup in, in Italy. Uh, unfortunately, we left with one to two, one to two, one to two losses against Brazil, Scotland, and Costa Rica. So we went home the day before midsummer, uh, and there was a a very bad, bad situation. Okay, let's go for uh, sports injuries. Per Enström, my first uh, friend and uh, underlecker, <laughs> when I was uh, overlecker, we have been working together since the uh, beginning of 1970. We wrote the book on sports injuries. Editions came and translated into 12 languages. And now we are uh, just printing the fourth edition. We got the Duke of Edinburgh Prize in the House of Lords in London 2010 for outstanding contribution to international education in sports medicine. Here are the book in some uh, translations, even in Russian and Japanese languages. Here was a presentation of the book in Paris in French, and here was the award in the House of Lords in London and we are still uh, invited to a dinner with the Duke of Edinburgh in Buckingham Palace. But it's not been done. So, now was my second interest. That's cartilage. When I was a young doctor, I operated a lot of patients, and I found a lot of cartilage damage. Uh, cruciate ligament, we learned how to treat. Meniscus, we learned how to lead, treat. And there was no treatment for cartilage. And cartilage will progress by increased activity and by mechanic wear and enzymatic di digestion, which means that the matrix of the cartilage is uh, uh, broken down by enzymes released from the cells and then uh, the mechanic wear, uh, make it ending up in a bone-to-bone -bone situation, for example, in the knee. 
So Hunter stated in 1743 that from Hippocrates to the present age, it is universally allowed that ulcerated cartilage is a troublesome thing and that once destroyed is not repaired. And that goes for now. Hippocrates, 400 before Christ, was the first physician to recognize and treat articular cartilage lesions. But he realized that they don't heal. So our goal and my idea was to see if we could regenerate articular cartilage in any way. And the key to achieve that is the cell, the chondrocyte. And so the cell is producing collagen type 2 and proteoglycans in a continuous way in the, in the cartilage. So I found, going through the literature, that Odie Smith uh, the first, was the first to isolate and culture particular chondrocytes. And she injected the cells into cartilage damage, but minimal uh, success. So I thought about that, and then I was invited to go to the Hospital for Joint Diseases in New York City with Viktor Frankl, the man in the yellow uh, jacket. We were uh, doctors at the New York Marathon at the time, and uh, uh, he uh, was very generous and gave me all the resources in the lab to uh, work on my project, use cartilage, solve out, uh, isolate the cells out the cartilage by enzymatic degradation, and grow the cells in a, a, a culture medium, and inject the concentration of the cells in a defect in the cartilage covered by a periosteal flap. It was presented in 1984, and uh, uh, you may see here, this is the experimental cells under a periosteal cover and no uh, really uh, damage left at 12 weeks. Here, with uh, no cells, but the same defect and the same uh, periosteal flap, uh, you see still a defect and an intense inflammation in the surrounding synovium. So that was great, 12 weeks. Well, you can see also here uh, that this uh, is reconstituted cartilage in the, in the experimental side, but in the control side, it's just bare bone. So it worked. I only had to do it for one year, and here's the one year which I did in Sweden after coming home. Here you see pretty good healing in the experimental side, bone, bare bone in the bottom of this uh, uh, control site. And here you see uh, microscopy, pretty good reconstitution of the cartilage in the defect, which goes from there to there, to there, down to the bone. And here, completely nude bone. So this was really a uh, uh, proof of the hypothesis that it's possible to use culture chondrocyte inject them in a cartilage lesion and have uh, uh, healing. Uh, we went further on. We, it would be more practical to have the cells on the scaffold, to uh, put the cells in the scaffold and put it into the defect, which would be easier to keep them there and give them support during the production of new cartilage. So here we did that, presented that in uh, 85 and you, we injected cells in a collagen sponge, sorry, collagen sponge here that was press fit into the cartilage defects. So we didn't suture it, we just press fitted it. And here you can see uh, pretty good but uh, healing, but no real healing uh, without the cells. So the cells are the key to this. So we started working on, when I get home, to transfer the cell technology in culturing from uh, rabbit cells into human chondrocytes. And that was in collaboration with uh, Professor Anders Lindahl, uh, who I'm still uh, working closely with. And the great step was in the end of 1987, when we had, had uh, the approval by the, by the uh, ethical committee of the University of Gothenburg to do some cases in human. Here's Anders Lindahl. Uh, doing the lab work, uh, which is a fantastic achievement, first time in the world that somebody had uh, 
been successful in growing cells that were of such quality that you could inject them into human beings. So this was uh, the next step going clinically. 1987, we started in October, and over 45,000 patients have been operated worldwide since then. We uh, had early indications, small chondral lesions. We had a, a support of normal cartilage in the periphery. But, and that was on the femur and the patella, but with growing uh, experience, we ha have widened the indications to be a large, uh, multiple, two or more, or bipolar lesions, that's bone to bone, that's uh, osteoarthritis. And here you see, first, atroscopy, identify the lesion, take cartilage for biopsy from un minor white bearing areas, take the biopsy to the laboratory, uh, isolate them after breakdown by enzymes for two to three weeks, and then you go back, clean up the, def uh, uh, clean up the defect, take a periosteal flap, sized to be sutured, and glued uh, to the periphery with fibrin glue, inject the cells under the periosteal cover, and let the cells do the work. So, that's, it. that's the way it was. Okay, this is a case. You see the defect here, and here you clean it out, no bleeding, down to the bone, and then you put here, here is an artificial membrane, uh, which we use nowadays more and more, and here was the original periosteal flap, which is autologous, like the serum we are using is autologous, and the cells are autologous. So we have no problem with uh, contamination of other complications. So here you see how thin this membrane should be. Here I'm injecting in two steps in the femur first, and then I close here and I go to the top so I get a, a good spreading of the cells. Here is another girl, 17 year old, downhill skiing, a skier in the top Bavarian uh, uh, landscape. She had this in 1994. Uh, one month after our publication of our results in New England Journal of Medicine, is an osteochondritis desiccans, a bone cartilage fragment got loose and split. They couldn't put it back. So they left this defect in the 17-year-old girl. She was operated in Gothenburg, the periosteal flap suited to the defect, injected cells. Here is it one year, the barbarian orthopedic surgeon sent me this. You can see completely healing of the defect. Here you can see the border of the new cartilage and the old cartilage. And here you can see that it has a stiffness that is pretty good. And here is the place where the cartilage was harvested, covered with uh, some fibrous tissue. Uh, here is uh, her uh, knee at uh, five years, uh, 46 months. And you see there is absolutely no uh, defect either in the bone nor in the cartilage. And uh, she was 17 years in uh, 94, and she is now still go doing downhill skiing every weekend in the winter, and she has had no problem. So it, it is a fantastic achievement uh, for a young girl to have that uh, healing. So we went to multiple lesions, and tibiofibular femoral uh, bipolar lesion, patellofemoral lesion, etc. So we got a little braver by time. Here you see one single lesion in a, uh, in a British Premier League football player, and here you see several lesions in one, two or more. And here you see bipolar lesion in the femur and in the tibia. This is osteoarthritis in a young boy, and here is bone against bone. Here is trochlea on the femur, and here is patella, the kneecap. And here you see bone to bone, but we can't fix it. So that gave us the concept of optimal environment condition for the short and long-term survival of the repair tissue. And what does that mean? We have to do concomitant procedure. 
unload the area when it's uh, under pressure or compression. We had to stabilize if you have instability. We have the restore uh, if you have uh, defects. This is a way to unload the knee that is affected by wedging up the tibia so you angulate the, the, the weight bearing from the damaged area. So we include this in the surgery as well as ACL and PCL reconstruction. This was a 39-year-old uh, female soccer player, uh, an ex-female soccer player. At the age of 16, she had a total meniscectomy medial in the knee, and she had astroscopy, and then in July 2000, she had a bone-to-bone -bone situation like this. Bone on the femur, bone on the tibia, age 39. Here is uh, the flaps with periosteum, covering almost everything. There is no meniscus. This is the tibia, this is the femur. It's resurfacing. Four years after, completely healing of the femur and the tibia. And she is now 14 years out and still doing fine. So, what have we done to, uh, to uh, evaluate this? Well, arthroscopy, microscopy, immunohistochemistry, mechanical indentation, and uh, the gamric, gaudolinium enhanced MRI. So here you see, uh, this is arthroscopy, where we probe and test the cartilage at 12 months. And here, biopsy is taken, showing the same staining characteristics as normal hyaline cartilage. And in polarized light, you see the collagen uh, anchoring in the bone. And the indentation stiffness was uh, normal in this patient nine years of the surgery and the biopsy. And here is a, a Finnish arch scan. We can do arthroscopic indentation test and measure the stiffness at the same time as we take a biopsy. And if the biopsy is hyaline or hyaline-like, you have a much better mechanical stiffness. So, this is the GAMRIC, Gaudolinium Enhanced MRI. Uh, Gaudolinium is uh, uh, absorbed to the proteoglycans. And you can see here that after two months after an, uh, two months after an ACI procedure here, you can see that there is a lack. Red is, uh, is a low concentration, and yellow and green uh, uh, is a better and up to blue. So at six months, you still have a lack of proteoglycans. That's, that's very bad. You have no uh, shock absorption. And here, at 12 months, it's much better. 18 months, it's much better. And in the patella here, 18 months, 18 months, 18 months, 22. It takes about nine to 15 months to restore the normal concentration of proteoglycans in the cartilage of a damaged knee. And that goes for any trauma, ACL, meniscus, you have a reduction of these, and that's important, because the knee is vulnerable for new injuries. Here is uh, a 18 year after ACI in the patella, normal cartilage. The cells are capable of producing the proteoglycans to a normal concentration. So that shows that it's okay. Uh, here are the results of the 10 to 20 years. You want to stop shortly? One. <laughs> One more? Ah. Okay. <laughs> here you see the results. 80, 84% had a good and excellent result of this diagnosis, which were the first one. Then we got braver, we took all this including. And 10 to 20 years after, still 74% good and excellent results, including these hard cases. And if asked, 92% of the patient would have ACI again. I think I'll stop there and come back next year and give you the rest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lars. I understand it must be really hard to, to yeah, you have a lot of information uh, to I give just us. gave you <laughs> two, uh, two pictures. Look here. Yeah. This is Achilles tendon, completely uh, uh, worn out. And 
To heal that, we put in a tendon transplant. But that would never heal unless we put an artelone ATR on. Suture it to this graft and to the ends. At one year, you have reconstituted the tissue completely without any other cells than the, the local cells that invaded and healed this. And that was the end of that story. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>